here. So um, I'm going to call the meeting to order. This is the regular council meeting for Minatrista for April 16th. And let's see, do we do the swearing in first or the Pledge of Allegiance? Okay, so we'll start out with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So with that, our next order will be to swear in our new council member. <coughs> Madam, I'm going to ask you to come up front here. Oh, if you want to repeat after me. So I, which is your name. I, John Truffle. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. To support the Constitution of the United States. To support the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the State of Minnesota. The Constitution of the State of Minnesota. And to discharge faithfully the duties. And to discharge faithfully the duties. Of the Office of Council Member. The Office of Council Member. For the City of Minnetrista, Minnesota. For the City of Minnetrista, Minnesota. To the best of my judgment and ability. To the best of my judgment and ability. So help me God. So help me God. So welcome. So next uh, we have our swearing in, uh, we have our introductions. We have, um, I'm Lisa Whalen, I'm the mayor, and to my left our council members, Patri Patricia Thole, <laughs> gosh, <laughs> have it, have it. Uh, Pam Mortensen, <laughs> Mike Molitor, Shannon Bruce, our new council member, John Chamberlain, and then our city engineer with WSB is Paul Hornby, our city clerk, Chris Lindquist, uh, Director of Administration is Cassandra Tabor, and then to my right are our City Administrator Mike Brony, Finance Director Brian Grimm, Community Development Director David Abel, our City Attorney with Kennedy and Graven Ron Beatty, and at the end we have our Chief of Police Paul Falls. So again, welcome everyone, and uh, also again, welcome John, uh, good to have you on board here. So next, uh, approval of our agenda, are there any changes or additions? We have two, thank you. Uh, we I would yeah. like to add maybe a third. Okay, hold on. So one, we will have a resolution to approve uh, not to exceed amount for uh, forensic coring of the roads that we talked about at a work session. And then two, we're going to add um, a Approval of, uh, help me out here. The seal coating. And the the, seal co the list for the seal coating for 2018. Okay, and? Um, I don't know if we need to have it formally here, but just not to lose sight that we have the question for Ron uh, regarding. Yep, that. that won't be on the agenda, okay. but yeah, we'll ask that. Okay. I think we'll do that during the road um, discussion. Okay, briefly. Sure we yeah. have sight of that. Yep, I already told him we'd ask him. <laughs> so, all right, good. So with those uh, two additions, um, any further discussion? Otherwise, a motion to approve with those two additions, and those would be then under business items, and we'll make those business items um, A, B, C, D, and E. So moved. To okay. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes. So next, um, special presentations. We have Mr. Paul Robinson with us this evening with Woodland Cove and a Woodland Cove update. Good evening and thank you for coming. Uh, good evening. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. Again, Paul Robinson with Woodland Cove LLC. Uh, we gave an update a couple, well, I think it was last year, and it had been a couple of years and we thought it would be useful to do this more annually than wait for a big gap. So we're just going to, this is just kind of a, maybe a little bit of flossing teeth, just kind of keeping up with uh, with uh, good practice to keep everybody informed how we're doing. Um, and as we 
you know, grow as a neighborhood, it becomes more and more of a, um, a significant part of the city. And so I, I sense that every time I have an annual meeting here, and I'll talk about it in a minute. So um, let's make sure I get to that. There we go. So I'm just going to give you just a quick update on where we are from a development status, uh, some comments that came up our, at our homeowner association meeting. I think actually some of these comments came up here recently with uh, the council uh, uh, appointment. And then um, just a couple other comments and then have any questions. So this will be pretty brief. So um, here's, here's the uh, Woodland Cove uh, plat. You have to tip your head so to the left is north. Uh, if you recall, back in 2014, we started with a large first edition. This was uh, uh, Mattamy Homes, um, 214 units. Um, to date, uh, now uh, that has changed over actually from Mattamy Homes to MI Homes. As you know, that's our primary builder. Although Mattamy Homes is still involved doing the develop development of phase three and two. So that, so far today, we've sold almost 80% of the homes sites in that first edition. So about 167 homes. And uh, the red homes are the Maddie homes and the orange homes are the MI homes. So you can see MI is starting to gain a little momentum and starting to become, uh, get a little bit, get their feet on the ground in the neighborhood. Then uh, that following year, we opened up the first edition of what we call the Cove in it, that has the lake access. And to date, we sold about 65% sold about of those uh, home sites. And we're just about out of the lake lots. So um, that's why we move forward with the next phase. Uh, then later that year, uh, the next year, Madden started working on uh, Woodland Cove Second Edition, uh, and uh, MI Homes is now uh, selling in that area. And again, I think they're um, gaining a little bit moment more momentum in that area. Um, it's pretty amazing, actually, when you see the types of villas that are going in there. They're in you know five, six hundred thousand dollar villas that are being built in that area. Mm -hmm. uh, then. We moved forward actually last fall, uh, started the next phase of the Cove. Uh, we had that, the really nice peninsula lots out there, uh, have a number of off lake lots, and then a few more um, lakeshore lots. And we've already taken a couple purchase agreements um, on home sites in that area. And then, of course, last fall as well, uh, Madden uh, started the grading and um, utility installation for uh, third edition and refinishing both. Lake Second Edition as well as Woodland Cove Third Edition this summer. There's going to be 157 units in that uh, in that phase, and I'll, I'll touch on this again a little bit later. So over all, all in all, we've sold 204 home sites. So if, I think on average there's about three people per home out there. So I think there's about 600 residents at this point out in the Cove, out in the Woodland Cove. So just, this is maybe a little more advertising. We're gonna have a little uh, fall parade house coming up. NIH is gonna be um, building a, a home we started right now. This is gonna be a pretty nice $2.3 million house uh, coming this fall. We also- um, now Where is that one gonna be? That's go uh, so that one's gonna be on the lake. Oh, okay. On one of the lots, okay. Yep, yep. yep. it's gonna be on, on one of the lake lots. Uh, then uh, another lake lot, uh, Charles Cut, coming in spring 2019, we're going to have kind of play to the empty nester. This is an empty nester, main floor master rambler on the lake. Uh, I'm hoping that after many conversations, probably 80% of my conversations are with empty nesters, that uh, this will take hold <laughs> on the lake. And then, uh, with, and then Ganya is definitely gaining uh, some traction in their area. They, they sold their... We believe they took a purchase agreement on their current model. They sold the model they had in the fall parade. They have, were having another one that they are finishing up just now that was going to be their model that they sold, and now they're going to be starting this model on lot seven, which is kind of, you can barely see it there. Um, and that's coming for the fall parade 2018. And then um, MI Homes is going, introducing another um, product, this small lot single family product, which is, will be interesting to see how that does um, in the neighborhood. It's, from what we hear in the marketplace, this is really what a lot of people are demanding. They really can't find new homes in the 300,000 range. And so these are nice homes on smaller lots, and it's really the trend that we're seeing across the metro area right now. And, and then, of course, the, they're, they're, we cut back the amount of townhomes in this phase to accommodate the small lots in the family, and so there'll be some, some townhomes as well. How are townhomes selling? Townhomes are selling very, very well. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really the only product. I mean, if you look at the townhomes at Woodland Cove right now, I mean, it's either empty nesters 
or you know, single people, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, people are trying to get their foot, you know, they're just getting their first job, they're trying to buy a house, I mean, they can't afford three, four hundred thousand dollar homes, so they need to find something in the two hundreds. And really, townhomes is the only thing mm -hmm. that happened. I, I know when we first got the townhomes approved as a part of Woodland Cove, we were very nervous about whether or not we'd ever be able to sell any because at that time there was all these lawsuits about yep. the maintenance, and, and really, townhomes were dead at that point. Yep, they and were. I think it was, I'm glad we stayed the course because I think that in the end, it's become, it's come back as a product that's pretty much in demand. I've heard it, it is, especially now. What are those, um, the townhomes, what are they range? I think that they, they start in the 200s, low 200s, okay. Okay. Mid, low to mid 200s. Mm -hmm. And then, so as a part of uh, Woodland Cove 3rd Edition, we're going to be bringing that trail through the Bon Blanc Woods. We have to do a little wetland delineation to make sure that uh, there's some boardwalk sections that will be installed and we're going to do some trail. Uh, but then we're also taking that trail through 3rd Edition, so we'll have a trail basically from the clubhouse all the way down to Highway 7 to the underpass. And then uh, with this space, we also have a couple commercial areas that we are ready to be marketed. And so we'll see if we get any traction on commercial. I mean, to date, our conversations on commercial have been really more about um, wanting more people to show up. And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. first, Rooftops. And, you know, I think it's still going to be a good location. I think that it eventually will sell. It's just a, we're a little on the early edge of being mm -hmm. able to get much there. Residents all want it, of course, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> And then, um, so then we had the uh, whole association meeting, very well attended. I'm trying to think, 80, 90 people showed up. Good. Um, we're gonna we're gonna bust up the seams in that clubhouse, you know, for their meetings. So we move them, we're gonna move them to the summer now, so we can have them outside. Um, but uh, one thing that kept, kept that came up from a lot of people was just whether or not uh, the city could consider raising that speed limit on Kings Point Road. And we know we're kind of new to the neighborhood, like we're the we're the new kids on the block. We get that. <laughs> But there's just, um, it's a little bit like, I would say like 110 going into Bartlett Boulevard mm -hmm. into Mound where it's 35 miles an hour, there's a lot of driveways. It just seems like a slightly higher speed limit would just be handy. Um, I personally set my cruise control every time so I can make it down the street. <laughs> <laughs> but, but so that's food for thought. I know that it's not up to the city per se, but I think the city has to petition or if it's a the process. Um, the other thing uh, that I think you heard the other night is we, brought up to the residents that we are now considering a, a right. second kind of cool bathhouse area. Uh, you know, right now, imagining 950 units sharing the one clubhouse mm -hmm. pool facility is starting to, to feel a little crunched. Um, and so we're, when I, I had on the, on the HOA meeting a big in bold no promises sign up there. <laughs> but, but we know we need to start talking about it, so that's why we're doing this. And, it, and so I guess I'm bringing it up today in case the city has concerns or wants to have additional information, I'd like to know that. But right now we're looking at a number of the different open spaces we have in the in that, um, I'll say it's in the fourth or fifth edition. Can you but show us on the map? You know, I don't. I like if I go back, I think we cruise through with these. Hold on. Here, actually, I can yeah. go on this one. Here. Yeah. Is the, what, which one is the, the, the red one? Oh, oh yeah. OK. So there's, there's a city park right in here. And there's a little bit, there's open space adjacent to it. So we, we thought that it could be, it could actually be just adjacent to the city park area. And so that was one idea. Uh, we have another park area right here uh, where there was going to be a top lot park where we could, that's another kind of central area that we were looking at. Um, and those are probably the two main contenders of just kind of ideas of where they could be located. We thought that the city park is probably the best because it's got the most open space around it and probably has the least impact. And it's actually, you know, from a geographic standpoint, it kind of spreads the two facilities out right. nicely. Yeah. And so that's, that's kind of what we were thinking. Um, and so you don't have to tell me tonight, but I mean, we can chat. I, I think the first step would be to talk to staff and. Okay. Um, bring a plan or an idea. And I think it would be a COP amendment, wouldn't it? Well, uh, they don't have a conditional use permit, but no, oh, we, okay. we work it in as part of their, their um, a site plan review or something as part of that phase whenever they got to it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess I want to make sure we hit a buzz saw before we went too far, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe bring it back to a work session so we can just get some information and talk about it a little bit so because it doesn't sound like I mean you're not ready you're not poised to do this next year or whatever no, no. just in the future okay yep. I think we want I think if we're going to do it and if it's going to make sense for us financially to pull it off then we might as well get it done 
at least plan sooner rather than sure. later so we can market it. So what's yeah. the benefit if we never tell anybody? Yeah, <laughs> sure. So that's something we'll work on. Um, the other thing is, um, now that I have more and more lake access home sites, you know, so my buyers in the mm -hmm. north end are, are they, they jump in their car, they go to the parking lot to go down to their boats at the clubhouse. Every one of them would rather have a golf cart going down there. And up till now, we basically said, you know, golf carts aren't really allowed legally on the city streets, but, you know, if you get a street legal one kind of, if you have turn signals and stuff, you're probably okay. Um, the problem is, is that the way the way we've been telling people is that you know one person complains and it's possible that they just could go away. And so I know the state law changed, and I, I, I heard that maybe somebody already asked for this, but I know the state law has changed. I know it's kind of a burden on the city, but if there were a process in place where we could actually permit the golf carts, then it would help us from a marketing standpoint. It would give these residents a little bit more uh, of an ability to actually rely on being able to take a golf cart down the, you know, because it's a big, you know, you buy a $10,000 right. golf cart and then somebody tells you you can't use it, you know, or if you design a garage to include it. So it's, it's at a, we're at a point where it's starting to impact us a little bit and we'd like to be able to market more formally and be able to allow it more formally. So. We, um, we've had this discussion, <laughs> so what I would tell you is talk to our chief. He knows uh, where we stand on <laughs> this issue, so I would say, um, you can give him a call and okay. talk to him. Here, don't do that. Okay. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> All right. Um, and then lastly, uh, one of the things that I guess we're, we're starting to bring it up more, a little bit more formally with our residents and, and now with you, that uh, you know, we built that underpass, it was probably $700,000. <laughs> we can all have a trail down to it. Uh, people have been telling us when they bike that segment of 11 down to the park entrance, it's kind of dicey. There's not a really good, good shoulder there. Um, especially if you're trying to bring kids down on bikes. And so now we have a couple hundred people living there, mm -hmm. you know, 600 people living there that are going to have access down to 7 and want to get into Carver Park. And that was part of the mm -hmm. sort of dream of being able to live out here and have this connectivity. And so it's in the 20, and here I'll go a little bit further so you can see where we're talking about. So that's the trail right. segments, what's circled now that we're mm -hmm. going to be putting in next year or this summer. And then the segment that, that is scheduled in the CIP for 2019-2020 is this yellow segment that you see highlighted here. Mm -hmm. Actually, in their, in their plan, it says 2019. But now we've had a couple of residents ask them about it. And so they kind of like go, well, maybe 2020. You know, like if they you know, can kind of see it sliding. Because obviously, there's a lot of demands on their time and money. Um, but again, you know, probably wheel. Probably one of the things is when you do your trail connection, then they may see a bigger need or see the connection. Right. So that might help, but we can, we can look at talking to them and asking, maybe we can, again, that would have to be a council discussion, maybe a resolution to support that. I mean, we'll have to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm yeah. Just, this is just highlighting it. So sure. this is that segment we're talking about. Yep. We can kind of see how it links in and then, you know, from a resident standpoint, then they see all these other trails that right. they're part of, right? You right. Know, so, so that's just kind of a, uh, it's a cool thing. It would be nice to be able to rely on having it come in in 2020, honestly, or 2019. Yeah. Um, Penny Steele's the rep. We don't really yep. have a direct relationship with Penny, but I know that a lot of times the council mm -hmm. members do, sure. so that's kind of why I'm bringing it up. And so that's that's what I have for yep. you all today and tonight. Um, I don't know if you have any questions of me based on things you've heard or any questions you might have about Women Cove, but I'm available. One, one question for you. Um, as you start looking at that commercial area, are you getting any sense of what is for interest of tenants? Um, so far, we're pretty early on in the process. I know that uh, there was not that long ago we had a gas station that was kind of interested, you know, more of a convenience kind of gas station. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, you know, hair shops, you know, a lot of the sort of things you'd see normally on a, you know, you know, got to have liquor, tobacco, and, right. no, you know. But no, I would say more of a coffee shop, um, gathering spots, you know, maybe a daycare. So I mean, those are some of the things that have been bandied about. We haven't actually had anybody talk to us about tobacco or liquor, but I mean, sure. <laughs> but I mean, if you look at every spot along the way, that kind of is one of those typical. Um, I think the residents would like a, a grocery store for yeah. us, you know, who yeah. wouldn't. Sure. Um, <laughs> But I, I, I'm thinking that's fairly unlikely, but it's not mm -hmm. impossible because it is a large area that could, could you know, with a lot of residents around it eventually. So. Thoughts? I, 
I don't, I think that's it. So we have a few things we can discuss at a future work session and staff would get back to you. Thank right, you. Thank you, for, thank you for coming. Okay, so um, we don't have anybody signed up for persons to be heard, so we'll move on to our consent agenda items. Uh, they consist of A, approve our regular meeting minutes from March 19th, B is approve our work session meeting minutes from April 2nd, and C is approve our regular meeting minutes from April 2nd, uh, D is a resolution to approve our claims, E is a resolution to accept the resignation of John Chumperlin from Planning Commission and elevate Paul Stone from the Planning Commission alternate to a Planning Commissioner, and F is approve extension of the preliminary plat of Highlands on Whale Tail Lake. Is there any discussion on any of these? Otherwise, is there a motion to approve consent agenda items A, B, C, D, E, and F? Um, one discussion item on item E. Okay. Um, do we have any alternates left on the planning commission? Yep. Yes. One, one more. Oh, okay. Yep. All right. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So moved. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Motion is made by, made by Ms. Mortensen and seconded by Ms. Bruce. Any further discussion or questions? Hearing none, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed, motion passes 5-0. So we'll move on to our business items. Uh, first business item is the Lotus Drive Improvement Project Agreements. Um, Mr. Hornby or Mr. Abel? I got it, Madam okay. Mayor and Council. Thank you. Um, as, as you recall, we've been working on this for some, some time now. Um, what the council is being asked to enter, in, enter into is two separate agreements regarding the Lotus Drive uh, area of the city. The first is a cooperative agreement between the city and the Metropolitan Council through its uh, Environmental Service Division. The cooperative agreement is a mechanism for the construction of the MCES improvements that would occur under the, the Lotus Drive street itself. The second agreement is an infrastructure construction agreement between the city and Mattamy, Minneapolis, LLC. The agreements that are in your packet this evening outline the responsibilities of these parties involved with respect to the improvements as defined throughout the, the various agreements. Um, this stems back, as, you, as I um, mentioned, we've talked about previously, this stems back to the Woodland Cove Master Development Agreement which was entered into back in April of 2012. It talked about many different improvements that needed to occur uh, with the Woodland Cove project, one of them specifically being uh, the Lotus Drive uh, reconstruction. And what that said was uh, the first phase that either abutted the Lotus, existing Lotus Drive or changed the alignment of Lotus Drive would trigger the reconstruction of, of Lotus Drive. Um, and that would have occurred back when the Woodland Cove second edition was approved, which we saw the history of here just a, a moment ago from uh, Mr. Robinson. And at that time, the city, the developer, um, all involved agreed to postpone the construction of Lotus Drive because of other uh, lingering improvements, specifically the, the MCES uh, horse main project that was likely coming sometime in the, in the future. And as you all know, that, that got delayed. The, the Met Council project scope part of it got delayed because County Road 44 project got moved up. So all that being said, we were able to make all of this come together so that um, the Met Council portion under Lotus Drive will be constructed as part of the Lotus Drive reconstruction project. Met Council will be paying their share of that. Mattamy will be doing that work. They're, they're the contractor that is doing the work for the force main, the water main for the city under Lotus Drive, and then reconstructing Lotus Drive itself. So all of that after uh, a lot of back and forth with uh, many different people um, finally came together. Um, and that is what uh, there are two resolutions as part of this item that the council is being asked to adopt. First one, resolution 64-18 would approve the agreement with the Metropolitan Council Environmental Services. Then the second one, resolution 65-18 would approve the infrastructure construction agreement with Mattamy, uh, which outlines what, what work they'll be doing and how they'll be reimbursed for that. So as I said, there is, there, uh, Met Council is paying their, their share of it. There's no direct uh, fiscal impact to the city as part of these projects. Um, but I think in the end, this is a win-win for everybody involved to, to get uh, the Lotus Drive Improvement Project uh, underway. 
Okay. The only question I had, and I asked Paul this earlier, and I just wanted for clarification, is Lotus Drive is currently 22 feet wide, and it will remain 22 feet wide. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Just because um, I know we worked hard many years ago. <laughs> and the layout that is uh, has been designed is the same layout that was approved as part of Woodland Cove um, with the islands at Trillium and so forth. Okay. Okay. The only one thing I would say is my my personal pre um, is I regret we don't have turn lanes at Lotus Drive and and 44. <coughs> we talked about that earlier, so I won't. On County Road 44. Yeah, on County Road 44. So, anyway, um, questions. I have a question. On page 62, um, 6B, it talks about the developer shall what what contractors the developer can use. Is that is that unusual to be telling a developer what contractors they can use it's a standard policy so whenever the metropolitan council does a project um, they have a certified list of qualified contractors that can work on the met council part of the project so it's specific to the met council okay but we're telling the develop the the, the develop the contractor to do the lotus drive part of the project yep we're telling the, de the developer which contractor they can use. Well, it, it's the Met Council is, yes. So for instance, on, just to clarify, the Met Council has pre-qualified contractors to do certain work on their facilities. So the developer could have used a different contractor to do the roadway and water main that's under the obligation of the city to construct and another contractor to construct the Met Council facilities. They put it out as a bid package as one, and they selected a contractor, a good contractor that is on the Met Council list. So that's how this happened to work out. Okay, and is, is the developer okay with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Probably get a better price versus mm -hmm. having yeah, two or three different so. contractors. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, as Paul was saying, I mean, that's really the issue. On our piece, they could have used somebody else. It was simply more uh, effective, cost effective for them not to do this. It's the same company. You know, I mean, th this is a somewhat peculiar deal for the reasons that we've talked about because we were trying to deal with two separate agreements that were coordinated. It's taken a long time mm -hmm. to get this. Uh, the council approved Woodland Cove third edition in November mm -hmm. and we've been negotiating these two agreements since then which needed to parallel one another for all the reasons that we've talked about and the big benefit and I know the council is aware of this is that what we avoid is Mattamy doing a project this year, putting in a new road, and then Met Council coming along in a couple of years, tearing up the road and putting in their project. <laughs> right. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Good. Any other questions? Okay. Um, hearing none, then is there um, a motion to approve resolution 6418, which is approval of the agreement with MCES? and resolution 6518, which is the approval agreement, approving the agreement with Mattamy Homes. So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. Mr. Chumpelin, beat you to it, Ms. Chan <laughs> Bruce. <laughs> um, so um, Ms. Bruce, uh, Ms. Mortensen made that motion and Mr. Chumpelin seconded that. Any further questions or discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed, motion passes. And ne next, we have approval of our construction observation proposal with FOTH I Infrastructure. Uh, Mayor, members of the council, um, so FOTH Infrastructure is a, a consultant that is also pre-certified by the Met Council to do work for them. Um, they had been the uh, Met Council's consultant working on the St. Bonifacius Interceptor project. And as you may know, that one extends from Highland Road through the eastern portion of Woodland Cove down Lotus Drive and into the regional park. And so that one was put on hold. However, uh, the preliminary plans were well developed and they already had gone through a number of reviews on those plans with staff and had the street plans pretty well laid out. And so as part of the um, uh, getting to all this agreement with Mattamy and so forth, it made sense to have both complete that design, both of the Met Council facility and the city street and water main system with review from staff. 
And then um, also, since they are the engineer of record, to have them also be involved as the construction observation team as a consultant to the city. So this agreement, in meeting the Met Council agreement, has both as a, as a subconsultant or as a consultant to the city, and then under um, this situation would have uh, oversight by your city uh, oversight. So for the work, um, both has prepared a proposal for um, to do the to do the construction observation and construction administration for the um, Lotus Drive improvements. And this also includes the um, the portion of the Met Council construction. The surveying and geotechnical materials testing will be done by the developer, as um, has been the case with the development projects. Uh, FOLTH has their fees estimated at $118,380 uh, for the work as described in the time frames. It was a three month period for construction. And that uh, WSB for construction oversight would have an estimated amount of $24,000. And we estimate that amount because, you know, for the most part, we're, we're having full BR representatives out there, but they will have to run things through us, such as shop drawings. There'll be meetings. Mm -hmm. There'll be some coordination on site. So that dollar for your city engineer would um, is estimated at twenty-four thousand. Full has submitted their proposal as a not to exceed for those for that three-month period of time, which includes uh, preparing record plans as well. Um, we're asking uh, uh, council to approve. Resolution 66-18, and that is the proposal with fourth infrastructure for the Lois Drive Improvement Project. All costs associated with this improvement is a pass-through to the developer. There's no cost to the city for this work. Okay, with that um, resolution, it also includes the um, 24,000. Um, correct, correct. Okay, not to exceed. I, I think it said not to exceed. It uh, says estimated. It's estimated. For I'm sorry, thank you. Okay. So what is the difference between estimated and not to exceed when you see this? When I put an estimated fee on something, it's because I, there's, there are influences that I have no control over. I don't have control over the Met Council, and I don't have a control over the, the um, developer schedule. That is up to them. And so when I can't control that, I'm not putting a not to exceed fee on it. Okay, but we would have to approve. Something so, so if we this. came back and we're going over, in fact, I'm actually working with Mike and Brian to set up a situation where, as we're approaching the limits on these budgets, that we have a mechanism to let council know that. Okay. And and again, these dollars are all paid by, in this case, Mattamy as the developer. Mm -hmm. So it's thank you for pointing that not to exceed, but it's an estimated. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Otherwise, yep. Yeah, question to uh, all of these situations where their costs are being assumed by someone other than the city, do they come through the city and then are paid back to the city? Is that the mm -hmm. process? Mm -hmm. yeah, we bill them back. So we'll incur them and then we bill them back to the developer of the land that use the applicant. Correct. Yep. Okay. And then with that, um, we have a letter of credit for this project then? We will, yes. Okay, so if for some reason or other we don't get paid, we, we can draw on the letter of credit. So we should be covered. Good, good question, okay. Any other questions? Otherwise, is there a motion to approve the construction observation proposal? As presented, it would be resolution number 6618. So moved. Okay, is there a second? I'll second. Okay, motion has been made and seconded. Ms. Mortensen made that motion and Mr. Molitor seconded. Any further questions? Hearing none, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes 5-0. So next uh, we have a change order for the Enchanted Lane Tuxedo Road and Grand View Improvement Projects. I believe this is Mr. Hornby as well. Yes, Mayor and members of the Council. Um, as you're aware, the um, Enchanted Lane, Tuxedo Road, and Grandview Avenue project was well underway last year when we were interrupted by the Met Council. And um, we did get quite a bit of work done last year. Uh, the base course is on. There's minor grading that remains and then some driveway tie-ins that remain and then the final lift of bituminous and the boat launch. Um, that's a point of negotiation between uh, the city 
city staff and uh, the Met Council to try to get the boat launch restored and open back up with this project. Um, so the change order is primarily for some grading work and some additional work that was added to the project um, at the pre-con meeting, mainly the adding a sign that uh, indicated that the um, boat launch would be closed for the um, duration of the construction. Uh, some of the uh, chimney seals that reduce inflow and infiltration on the manholes on Grandview Avenue. And uh, the remainder were for grading. And two of the items were for driveway modification. There was, um, right when you come into Red Oak, there's two driveways there, um, very close proximity. Mm -hmm. And we needed to remove some curb and the grade that the contract that the development had coming into that was very abrupt. Um, I don't know how their elevations worked out, but we worked with the property owner there um, to rework the grade of the road and then also go back on his driveway, regrade it and, and uh, on two of them, and then um, London in much nicer. Actually, he's very happy with the way it turned out. Uh, I'm happy with the way it turned out. It came out, I couldn't have asked for it to come out any better than it did and the transition of the roadway in that area. Initially, you were gonna have a, and literally, you were gonna have a bump that did one of these in the road. Mm -hmm. Not desirable, but we changed that where it's a nice smooth transition now. So that's one, that's one of the, the, that's the grading modifications for the driveways. And then the remainder of it is mainly with Enchanted Lane and Tuxedo Road in um, regrading some areas in order to get the roadway to drain and so when we go out and survey the roadway during design you, know, you don't survey every minuscule point along the way you should typically go in 50 foot increments and run elevations across and you draw for your profile of your road you put a best fit line through there and base your design and quantities on that it's not uncommon in reclamation projects to have to do this but we had to go back and regrade some areas so that we did, weren't trapping water um, there were a couple of areas where we ended up having and in an existing condition, having low points with no outlet. So regrading the profile to let that water go out where it can have an outlet uh, on Tuxedo Road. And then on Enchanted, able to get the road high enough on the lakeside to get that water to run off. So we don't have that same situation where we have water sitting on the road. Mm -hmm. So that's basically what those, are, what th those grading improvements were. There was also um, some grading improvements that in work orders, the amount of about seventy six hundred, almost seventy seven hundred dollars that we promptly forwarded down to the Met Council to pay, because there was additional work that was uh, necessary due to the delay caused by the Met Council and their force mate. So, for instance, in this case, I can't give them any more. <laughs> we're working on it. I did also send them. I think it was about thirteen hundred dollars in additional costs for engineering time. Okay. Uh, and there will be, you know, some work also associated with the boat launch. Um, I think they're going to have to they at least pay half of that, I would think, for the damage that was done by the directional drilling. And they had offered up to pay for part of that as well. So I think they're not, this isn't going to be new to them. And we've all been communicating by email and by phone about how we're going to address that. Um, so with that, the... The change orders that we did get were in excess of $26,000. We got that down with a reduction to the Met Council for the 7,600. We got that, negotiated that down to $17,766.89. Uh, the change order is a um, unit-based change order, although some, most of those items is listed on the very back page are lump sum. Um, I don't expect any additional cost with those items with this project, those uh, because these have been already addressed, and that also amounts to about uh, two and a half percent of construction, which is within the budget you would typically set for this type of a project for a contingency, usually at five percent. Uh, with that, we recommend that the city council approve resolution 67-18, approving change order number one uh, for this project and. There is no payment associated with that today. We'll process a um, pay request for the contractor at the next council meeting. Okay. Questions? So do we, do we always budget, like Mr. Harvey said, 5% for contingencies when we do a project like this? 
Yeah, I mean, at least a three to five percent or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And what was budgeted on this? Do you remember? I mean, it was. We did it. We did Halsted at the same time. Um, I want to say it was the five percent. Okay, what but I'm it's within. Recalling, yeah, and I think I'm even yeah. I'm thinking on the PFA project, it was the larger amount, so it was three percent. But then it's usually between that three to to five percent. Uh, you, you know, on, on a smaller project, there can be a little more variation per, percent wise or whatever. Percent Obviously, wise, smaller yeah. dollar to smaller dollar or whatever. But um, yeah, we should be there, and and I think there, this should pretty much be. There shouldn't be too many other change orders coming that you're aware of, right, with being the project wrapping up this spring or? Uh, no, not that I'm aware of. There's uh, some driveway work that needs to be done, but I'm just anticipating that can be done under the okay, contract-based okay. items we have already, the okay. unit, rate, unit price items we have. Okay. 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 So when the contractor has to go and fix some of the stuff that's falling apart from the base course, I assume that's part of the overall contract and not a change order for them? That's not included in the change order. That's included in the unit pricing on the contract. We had, I think, two of the things that we saw happen. There's a couple spots where, you know, this was very late in the year paving. It's not going to be unusual to have a little area of trap moisture that might break up a small area of pavement, and we typically have to saw those out, recompact those, and, and skim over the base course before we put the final lift on. We essentially patch it before we put the wear on. Um, that's also why we recommend when we do street reconstruction projects that we put the wear on the following following the frost cycle for the exact same reason. We'll see some of that on Halstead Drive as well. Okay, good. All right, any other questions? Otherwise, are you in favor of approving resolution number 6718, approving change order number one for those projects as listed? So moved. Okay, motion has been made by Ms. Bruce. Is there a second it? I'll second that. Okay, and seconded by Ms. Mortensen. Any further questions? Hearing none, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed, motion passes 5-0. So next, um, we had a lengthy discussion, a very good discussion at our work session. So item number D is adding uh, forensic coring for eight of the roads, as we indicated in our work session, we talked about um, which projects we're going to be doing for 2018. We, we talked about the overall five-year and beyond um, capital uh, pavement management plan. And this, we're bringing back the forensic coring for the eight roads as listed. I think it's eight roads that we listed um, in our work session. And this would be not to exceed $5,000. Um, staff, anybody want to add anything to that, or? Do you want the names of the roadways that we're going to call? Maybe just for the record might be good. Okay, so these wouldn't necessarily all be performed as far as a treatment for the roadway in 2018, just so um, our the audience is clear on that. But, right. Uh, we have Hunter's Court, Pheasant Crossing, Glacier Court, those are all in Hunter's Crest. And then in the Turtle Creek area, we have Forest Court, Turtle Road, Stone Creek Court, North Home Drive, and Eagles Nest Drive. Okay. And those we're just going to be testing at this point to determine if we can do mill and overlays on those roads. So thank you. All right. So is there a motion to approve the forensic coring not to exceed, and this is a not to exceed, uh, 5,000 for those eight roads as Mr. Hornby just listed? So approved. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Motion has been made by Mr. Chamberlain and seconded by Mr. Molitor. Any further questions? Hearing none, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes 5-0. So next we also talked about which roads we were going to approve for our chip seal schedule for 2018. Um, and before we, and then after that, I'm going to ask Ron about special assessments. So there is a list in our packet, in our work session packet. Do you want to list all of those um, by name? I could read through those if you'd okay. like, Mayor. Okay, yep. The Lakeside Circle, Lakeside Drive, Pinnacle Way, Wind Ridge Trail, Fairway Ridge Court and Fairway Ridge Drive, Crest Ridge Court, Bayside Lane, Sunnybrook Circle, Sunnybrook Drive, and Sunnybrook Lane. Okay, and those would be for our chip seal 
Didn't we used to call this um, seal coat? Seal crack, coat. Crack fill and seal crack, coat. Okay, and it's the same thing. Yes. So, all right. Again, this was discussed um, at our council meet at our work session previous to this. Any questions or comments? Otherwise, is there a motion to approve <coughs> the uh, chip seal schedule for 2018 as listed? So moved. Okay, is there a second? I'll second that. Okay, a motion has been made, and a motion by Mr. Molitor was made and seconded by Ms. Mortensen. Any further question or discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 Motion passes 5-0. And next, Mr. Beatty, um, just a question for you, as Mr. Molitor pointed out. So in our work session, we just talked about um, doing um, Sunnyfield next year, possibly, and again, this is, we're thinking about it, anticipating it, and the question came up, can we assess or do a special assessment um, against or towards the school, since they're the only property owners that would be affected? And the simple answer uh, is yes. I mean, you, you can't assess the state of Minnesota without their permission, but it is possible to assess other governmental entities, counties, school districts, and so forth. Okay. All right. And we'll so, be talking with the school regarding that issue. So you said counties as well? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, basically any, I mean, the state is a sovereign. Everybody else, including cities, are uh, creatures of the state, and so you can assess anybody else. Same rules apply. Benefit has to be shown, and usually government properties are unique in some way, so the assessment might have to be different than a row of single-family houses, but yes, you can assess other governmental entities. Okay. Good. That answers that. So. Thank you. Good enough. Thank you. So now we will move on then to, that concludes all of our business items, so we'll move on to staff reports. We'll start with our city administrator, Mr. Baroni. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor and council members. I have a number of items I'd like to uh, review with you. Um, as you know, our next meeting is May 7th. That's three weeks, not our typical two weeks. Just a reminder on that. Um, again, welcome to Mr. Schumperlin and uh, as our newest council member, and we're going to keep him quite busy this week. We have a schedule of orientation sessions with our departments, and uh, that schedule is as follows. On Tuesday, he's here to meet with police at 9 a.m., uh, public works and engineering at 10, and then with uh, Ron Beatty and our legal uh, at 3 p.m. Uh, he's back on Thursday. 10 o'clock with community development and 11 with finance and then he finishes up on Friday at 9 a.m. with the admin. So like Is I he? said, um, we're going to orient, orientate him to death, I guess, this week. So, um, And then there will be a test. No, no <laughs> test. No, I don't like tests. No <laughs> test. <laughs> no test. Okay. Um, just want to let everybody know that I got this afternoon at 4 o'clock an email from the business agent for our police supervisors and they accepted our contract proposal. We last met with them on April 5th um, as they've been kind of want to do over the course of our negotiations. They kind of threw one more item at us, which we considered, but we had to do a little research um, on that just to make sure that what they were asking for um, was something that other cities had potentially done besides just wanting to agree with it. We did not. So we told them that. Last week I sent them an email on Friday and said our last offer is our, our final offer is our final offer. And they got back to us uh, today, this afternoon, and accepted the offer. So you should be seeing a red line agreement in your packet uh, at our next council meeting. A um, one other item uh, related to um, public safety. Uh, we did have a chance to meet um, with um, the Mound Fire Group, uh, the, the administrators and managers that are part of the uh, Mound Fire Commission met, um, I would say it was uh, last Thursday, and essentially this is again to, dis to discuss the, the, the kind of the ongoing situation with the city of Minnetonka Beach. They've been considering pulling out, uh, trying to renegotiate their contract. It really hasn't sat well, I would say, with all the other entities, but nonetheless, uh, the Mound Fire Department, uh, Chief Peterson, has been working diligently. We had a meeting, um, I would say, about a month, month and a half ago, 
or so we kind of talk about it. We had somebody there from the uh, Minnetonka Beach City Council to kind of and their administrator to kind of give their point of view. Um, we were under the assumption that they were going to kind of uh, consider our offer at a future date as we've been working on this. Well, at their uh, meeting on Monday the 9th, they didn't vote to accept an offer from Long Lake Fire Department to go with them, but what they did vote to do is vote to proceed to pursue a contract with Long Lake. It's a little bit of a technicality, but nonetheless, they are interested in entering into a contract with Long Lake. And where that has left us, which is why we met uh, last week, uh, the administrators and managers, is to kind of see where we're at. Um, it's not a done deal that they're leaving. I think there is some uh, divisiveness, or I don't know if they're divided, let's put it that way, the council members on that particular council. So it's not a done deal that they are leaving. Uh, but again, we, we've, and they only meet monthly. So the next time they'll meet is middle of May. And so we already have and have had a um, meeting uh, of the Mount Fire Commission where Council Member Bruce and Mayor Whalen and I will be there on the 25th of April. So we'll have plenty of time to kind of talk about where we stand with them. So we'll see what happens. Um, I think we can manage our way out of it one way or the other, whether Mintaka Beach stays or not. I hope they stay. I think it's in our best interest to kind of keep the group together in the Mount Fire Commission, but that is to be determined. So we'll keep you updated on that. Um, the city administrator performance review will be at our next city council meeting on May 7th. Um, and then also at the May 7th meeting, uh, we're going to recognize outgoing council member Patricia, Patricia Thole that night. And so the way it will work is, as we've done with a number of retiring or um, uh, the council members that have left office uh, for whatever reason, we will have a work session that will start at 530 and we'll end at 6.30 and then we'll do the coffee and cake thing between 6.30 and 7 between the two meetings and then we'll come back at the regular city council meeting and then we'll recognize her with uh, um, a plaque for her years of service not only in the council but also on the planning commission. So um, I think that's all the items that I have. So. Okay. A couple others from which to hear from. So. All right. David? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. I've got three items. Um, one is just an update on our comprehensive plan. Um, at our last meeting, I had uh, alluded to the fact that I'd be bringing a resolution approving that draft of the comp plan. Um, after further analysis and discussion with the Met Council staff, um, we don't need a resolution at this time. It still needs to go to the Met Council board for the oh, review. Yeah. So mm -hmm. staff's yeah. given their comments. And so it's, it's scheduled to go to the Met Council Board here within the next month, I would say. So once they've reviewed it, um, I will at some point be bringing back okay. a resolution that will give the final blessing, if you will, of the, the comp plan. So I just wanted to give you an update on that. Um, the other update stems from the March 13th Park Commission meeting. Um, unfortunately, our council liaison was ill and couldn't attend, so I'm just going to give a, a short update on something that was brought up by a park commissioner at that meeting. Um, this was regarding uh, the property at 5685 North Arm Drive, which is known as the Mildred Banks home. I believe it's a stop on the city bus tour. I think you've stopped there before. It's currently owned by Josh uh, Sabaski. Um, so the property is uh, on the market. It's been for sale for uh, since uh, February of 17. Um, the Park Commission talked about the historical significance of that property or of that, that structure to the city. They're, they're thinking it's probably the oldest structure in Minnetrista. Um, from what I, the research we've found, it's, it's the um, late 1800s, 1880, I think, is around when they think it was built. Um, so there's a number of different things they talked about. The idea of moving the structure to City Hall campus was brought up. The idea of uh, exploring the purchasing of the property, the use of park dedication funds was brought up. Um, to summarize, there was, there was support amongst the commission to recommend that the council look into the property. They, they talked about grant ideas uh, given its historic. And so we dug into that a little bit, knowing a little bit about uh, historic properties and designations of them. I know to get funding, you have to get, get properties or structures on the, the registry. 
And it turns out that this property was looked at back in 1994. The Minnesota National uh, uh, Register evaluation was conduct conducted. Um, so they did have people come out to the site to go through the process. Unfortunately, at that time, um, it was determined that the property is not eligible for historic funding. Um, lacks integrity of design uh, and workmanship. And the big thing is there's been too many alterations done to it over the years. Additions, windows, paneling, interior paneling was listed as a, as a problem. So um, there's a number of criteria as to why it's not eligible. Those were some of the big ones that were, that were listed. So in terms of grants, if you will, from a historical standpoint, it looks like it's pretty limited from, from that standpoint. Um, so we, we did look into that already. Um, so I just wanted to, to bring that to the council's attention, I guess, and also, um, I don't know if you wanted to bring it back at a, another meeting for more discussion or, or if you want to give direction now as to what you want to do with the property um, with the Parks Commission's recommendation. But um, that's, that was what was discussed at the March 13th meeting. Mm -hmm. Questions? What's the assessed value? The assessed uh, value of it's like two forty one two forty yeah two forty one I think I see, yeah right. and he's asking there, uh, quite 221. a bit more more money than that for it. <coughs> you know the asking price was three forty four nine. That's a little cabin. Right. That's the log cabin. We sometimes yeah. refer to it as the little log cabin. Yeah. yeah. They're asking how much? Three hundred and forty four thousand nine hundred. How many acres? Two point oh. five. Yeah. Under three. So I'm I'm inclined to let the market find a buyer for them. I don't see a reason why the city would purchase that. If somebody asked, and I know nobody has it, but if somebody asked, I would say the same thing. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that yeah. too. I would agree as well. I mean, if if the alterations hadn't been done and it could be listed as a historical um, on the historical register, then we would be eligible for grants. Um, it might be a whole other story. If right. if there was a group of people in Minatrista that wanted to take it on as a private fundraiser entity type thing, you know more power to them. Um, yeah, there's a number of logistical things after thinking about it because the owner of the property may not even want it listed as a historical property because once it's listed as that, there's you're limited on what you can do with the building. So that would be the other facet. You'd have to check with the property owner to see if they're interested. And then there's also the thing, well, if he wants, he, they, he, they uh, want to sell and they get an offer, what, you know, it's, it, there's just some logistical complications there, so, but. Um, I also think, you know, it's not just purchasing of it, it's also maintaining it. Um, right, restoring it. <coughs> and, yeah. and securing it, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's kind of out of the way, it's, I can just see that being a haven for vandalism and uh, oh. other things of that nature that um, I think could really be mm -hmm. pretty hard to, to take care of, really. Yeah. I mean, I think it'd be great if everything could fall into place and, you know. Yeah, had a lot of ifs and buts there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. That's fine, Madam Mayor and Council. Okay. The, the one other issue I wanted to bring you up to speed on was, if you recall, we had a uh, Mr. Olpheim uh, attend one of our recent council meetings regarding a noise noise issue and a, a noise uh, situation that he um, is dealing with. We did get an opportunity to get our building official and building inspector out to hear the noise for themselves. It doesn't run all the time, so it took a little while to coordinate that, but they did finally get out there. Um, it is, um, they, they, you can hear it. I mean, it, it is, it, it sounds like a fan. We do, there was some video taken of it with just cell phone video, but um, you know, they, they did hear it. It does appear to be somewhat noisy, if you will. Um, but uh, so the, the question, I guess, what we're, we're looking for a little bit of direction from on council. Um, Ron and I had a discussion today about, um, and what Mr. Olpine was talking about was the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency noise decibel 
regulations, which we don't currently have in our city ordinance. Um, and that's what he was referring to. We, we do have an, a noise ordinance. It's, it's pretty ambiguous the, the way it's read, um, but we do technically have uh, an ordinance re re um, regarding noise. And I guess the question is though, um, is, is this something the city council wants to, to get involved with trying to enforce? There would be a lot of, I guess we can see issues with trying to enforce our noise ordinance and especially not having the MPCA rules adopted in our ordinance. This is another issue that, that could occur and certainly it could end up, um, if, if, if end up involved, um, it, it could end up costing the city money. So it, it, back to the question is, does the council want us to get involved from an enforcement standpoint, not knowing where that might go, or do do you see this more as a private property owner d dispute that um, they would have to work out without the city? I have a question. So, first, actually, two questions. First of all, did we? Oh, well, here's three. Uh, first of all, did we measure the decibel? We do not. Okay. We, do, we do not have. That, that's yeah, that's correct. The that's, where the, that's the problem. That's the problem with enforcing a noise ordinance. Is a we, first of all, we don't have the equipment to sure. do it. B the the other problem you have with that is is um, who's you know what what is the equipment? Is it certified? Is it is it sure? Is, right. you know, that's a whole, yeah. Attorneys and judges quickly pick apart who's doing the measuring right. and, and how they're doing it and what equipment they're using. Yep. So that therein lies your problem sure. with trying to do noise issues. Okay, so that, that takes care of it. Mm -hmm. one of the other questions. But the third question I have is, um, since the uh, MPCA has a level, a decimal level, um, does, is, wouldn't this be, fall on them to enforce that and that have them take that issue up? Because that's Minnesota wide, is obviously we're part of that. So why doesn't this become an issue for them to enforce their code? Good question. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, I, the the issue that we've talked about um, stems around what is the problem, what tools do we have to address it, and what's the appetite of the council to spend what I think would be not a uh, not insignificant amount of money to pursue this. We do have an ordinance, as David said, which simply talks about um, it being illegal to have noises that, are, that unreasonably annoy people. This may well qualify. It does not have a decibel level like the PCA does. It provides for both a criminal penalty and a civil penalty. It's a somewhat peculiarly written ordinance. There's a section on um, construction, traffic, and noise, and then there are other provisions that are probably more designed for loud parties where a ticket might be exactly what you want. I don't think this is a situation with a ticket for where a ticket would solve the problem, a criminal penalty. It would probably be a civil penalty, but the question is, are we prepared to do that? As David said, we don't have uh, even even in, with an ordinance that does not have a specific decibel level, that's going to be the first question. What do you mean it unreasonably annoys somebody? What is the level? We don't have the equipment. We don't have the certification. We don't have any ability. We're really just not up to, to speed in doing that kind of thing. Um, does, you know, I kind of look at it as, does it affect a large number of, of members of the public? It, this is not in the nuisance section. But I think it can be analogized to that. There's a difference between private nuisances and public nuisances. And public nuisances are those that affect some large number of individuals. In other words, not just, a, just not one person. This seems to be a problem specific to the one neighbor who is very close to, to the fan. So I think everyone on staff is sympathetic to his situation, but it does not seem to affect a large number of people and the question is do you want to spend the time and specifically the money in trying to take this on or say you know we sympathize with you but this is a private a private issue that you'll have to pursue and a couple of other things to <coughs> chime in on so we have probably two areas where this could lie if we did do this as a business line we don't we don't we're not in the noise monitoring 
or noise evaluation business. Could be in our police area with some enforcement. I can see a CSO being part of their job potentially. I don't know, other cities, not here. Uh, same with our building inspections, building official. They're the ones that went out there. They generally enforce building codes. This is a fan that's on the outside of a building that was altered recently. So those are two areas. But this is not what we do. I mean, our building official and our building inspector are quite busy just doing their building official stuff and their building inspector duties as well as our CSO. So this is, this is not something we do. As uh, Mr. Beatty mentioned, it doesn't come up very often. I don't think you want to go through the training and equipment purchases just to assess the noise, nor do you want to waste, I think, waste your time, money, and effort changing an ordinance to enforce it. I think, as Mr. Beatty uh, pointed out quite well, this is one neighbor against another. And, you know, we were, again, as he said, we're sympathetic to his plight to have to listen to this very loud fan. I heard it. Uh, it is fun. I didn't hear it in person, but I heard the video of it, and it sounds pretty loud. Uh, I can understand that, but I just don't think this is our, up our alley. So, And I, I seem to recall when he was here talking about the problem that it seemed like he hadn't really exhausted all of his... Um, that just talking to his neighbor about the problem, he seemed to leave uh, that door open, that he said that there that. was a possibility that it might still be resolvable. Right. Did that, that was brought up, that, that's still the hope. Mm -hmm. um, we've, we've talked to both sides, so I don't, I guess, I don't know that that's probably likely to occur. There, there's some tension there, so um, that's the, Mr. Oldpime's hope, is can we have a conversation and try to figure this out? Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know that both parties are willing to do that though. I know, I believe uh, Nick Olson just last week called the other party and I don't think it was met with a lot of acceptance. Like, sure, I'll take it off my house. I don't think we got that, but you know, it was just more to point out the problem. So I think they're aware that we're aware. Mm -hmm. I think they're, he's also aware that his neighbor's not happy with it. So our hope is, it's, is uh, Mr. Abel said, is maybe they can get together and talk, but we've tried to contact both they don't seem to be agreement on the few conversations that they've had. So I don't know if it's really our job to get them to talk, but hopefully they will. You know, and one ordinance that, that we can enforce is the building code. But apparently there's no violation of the building right. code in any of this. No. Mm -hmm. So is this, this is, if I remember correctly, this is an exhaust fan for a fireplace, gas fireplace. Correct. Yep. Uh, in your experience in listening to it, did it sound abnormal to other fireplace fans? I mean, we have a lot of them in the city. Yeah, it, it's it's loud. It's, it's louder, loud. and it, mm -hmm. I guess um, from the, our research of it too, it's more of a uh, it's a big fireplace, and that's why it's more oh. of I guess what you would call a commercial grade oh. mm -hmm. fireplace, <coughs> still acceptable in residential applications, but. Sure. Um, there's a, so it's not only the size of the, the fireplace itself, and that's what requires the size fan that you have, right. but they're also um, using it purely as a, an aesthetic feature. It is not used to heat the home, right. which means that all of the exhaust, typically you'd split it 50-50, half of that air would come into the house and heat your house. Okay. The other half would go out for the, to, to, to circulate and ventilate. All of that is going out, so all of the noise is going out. None of it's going in the house. It's all being directed outside, which they can do. Obviously, it's not the most energy efficient thing to, to do, but um, therefore, they can run that. They will run that all throughout the summer because it's not heating their house. It's merely... Over oh, in the summer, day. too? Yep, yep. They, oh, okay. So the, the few warm days that we've had, um, it's been running. It, it, in, uh, the idea or the fear and likelihood is that they'll continue to run it throughout the summer because they're only using it to look at it. Yeah. <laughs> it seems odd to us, but hey, yeah. different strokes for different folks. Oh. Okay. So at least we wanted to get you yeah, updated on all right. that. And I don't know where Well, right we, now I think we, we just have a lot on our plate. We yeah. have a number of ordinances that we're looking at. A um, question for Mr. Beatty. Can this homeowner pursue a state resolution through the state of Minnesota? Well, he probably could. I, he could also pursue a private nuisance. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's not without remedies. Okay, I, I'd encourage yeah. to pursue those. Yeah. Yeah, 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 we could certainly help him and tell him that, but ultimately, I think if this guy's trying to prove that this is exceeding some state 
uh, threshold that he's going to have to hire somebody and sure. right. certified to measure it, and right. not us. Yeah, he's he's apparently measured it, but you know the problems with those devices and light meters and everything else is you have to have high quality equipment. You have to be certified to use them. The equipment has to be calibrated every once in a yeah. while, I and mean, you'd be able to be able to test that I pointed the thing and it read such and such, and I know what I'm doing. You know, and I, I don't know whether he's qualified or not. Uh, yeah, but cer certainly nobody here has. He has an iPhone app, so I mean. Maybe there's download. other remedies. Maybe he could, I, I hate, I mean, build a, a soundproof wall on his property or something. I mean, you know, I mean. Moat. No, no, there's, <laughs> so there's soundproofing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that might be another option. Well, I mean, it is unfortunate. Yeah. I think everybody who's experienced yeah. It recognizes that they would not want to live next to it. It's yeah, just, uh. you know, even the simplest litigation is ten to fifteen thousand dollars, and do you want to spend that? Yeah, I'm not hearing you do. No. no. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then, City Clerk, uh, Miss Lindquist. Madam Mayor, members of the council. At the last council meeting, um, there was a discussion on whether a newly appointed council member would become an incumbent for the election in November. I contacted Hennepin County for clarification on this. Um, I was told that technically under the definition of it, of incumbent, the newly appointed council member, in this case, John Shepperlin, would be the incumbent. With further discussion with Hennepin County though, um, they do not use the word incumbent on the ballots. For a city? For, for local. Municipal? For mm -hmm. municipal and for many other races. Um, I know they do for um, they do for judges. judges. <laughs> yes, they do for judges, and, and they told me that's the only one they do use it for. Okay. So, you may see the incumbent on on a ballot, but it will not be under the local race. And I did for for my satisfaction. I went to one of the old ballots from 2016, and your name um, was not there was not the word incumbent behind your name. Okay. So. All right. All right. Thank you for looking. But they are just listed first. No, they're no, randomly. No, it's a are random. Because I know it's, every it's a count. lottery. It's it. They don't. They don't. Uh, it's not first come whoever get, goes in first or whoever signs up first. That is not the first name on the ballot. It's a total it, it's, lottery. It's a total lottery. Yeah. Okay. And then every every di every polling place is different. Then. Mm -hmm. And so, in other words, if if the uh, the people that file there's three people that file john joe sally whatever maybe sally's first in that polling place but then sally's third in the next polling place and sally's second in the other polling place so it, it rotates hmm. yeah that's different in minnesota because in colorado they listen first yeah no that that is yeah. not how okay. it works in minnesota yeah. so. then miss Tabor, did you have one item Yes, so uh, members of the council, I just wanted to give you an update in regards to the email that I sent out last week as I made everyone aware. Um, Chad Bartley, our building inspector, gave his two weeks notice last week. Um, he is looking at a, or he is going to another city position um, for just an increased compensation. And so we're obviously wishing him the best of luck for that, but I did want to let you know that we have posted for a full-time position. Chad's last day is the 25th, and the position currently is slated to close on the 27th. Um, as you know, depending on how hiring processes go, sometimes we've had to extend that in the past, so we'll just watch how that turns out. Um, and then the other thing that David and I have worked on um, this week as well is posting for a seasonal position. If you remember, if you recall, we've used um, Jack Mullen in the past seasonally. Um, he is available to do some work for us in the coming weeks um, as Chad leaves, but it's not the level that we're needing based on the um, permits and things that are coming in. So we are looking to see what we can bring in for other seasonal assistance as well. Dude, when you say, you don't mean seasonal, you mean interim? Um, it, the, it's the considered word seasonal. Yeah. Yeah. seasonal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But yes, you're, but you're yes, correct. Okay. Interim. The purpose it would serve the purpose it would serve would be that, but the term that's used is seasonal. Okay. Mm -hmm. So is that for the private sector? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. So. All right. Any other staff reports? Okay. Um, so just, um, I just want to 
briefly mention, I know our public works has been very busy these last few days, and um, they've been, I know I just talked to Gary this afternoon, this evening, and he said that they were working like 17 hours, you know, just on, on Saturday, I believe. So they've been out plowing, and uh, thanks to them uh, for all their hard work and dedication. And I know the police have been out in this as well. Uh, so again, thank you for for your continued service as well. We really appreciate it. So I know it's hard to get. It was very hard to get around. So we appreciate that. So I have a couple things. Um, one, I attended the um, personnel committee meeting, as Ms. Tabor said. I think we have another one scheduled for next week um, to do my uh, Mr. Baroni's review. Um, and then um, let's see. I attended the regional council mayor's meeting. It was very interesting. Um, defining our future uh, landscape for Minnesota and it was uh, Gary Johnson who was with the Department of Forest Resources and Urban Community Forestry from the Minnesota um, Extension Lab and Nursery and very interesting on how things are changing and what trees are good to plant in boulevards and so on and maybe I can share more details about that at a later date um, and then also uh, the Director of Global Change Ini Initiatives from the Science Museum was there. I also attended the Northwest um, Hennepin um, Northwest League, and uh, our speaker was um, Jim Atkinson with the Atkins from Hennepin County Assessor's Office. He provided us with a very nice, a very thorough report, and uh, uh, I can share some of those um, statistics with you maybe at a future work session, because it's just too much to do right here, and maybe staff can make some copies too. And then also, I attended the Gillespie board meeting um, this past Thursday. So with that, I'm done. Oh, one other thing, I'm sorry. One other thing I want to mention is, so we have a new uh, council member on board, and we usually try and disperse, if you will, our um, commission assignments kind of evenly, so everybody gets something. So just a question, I know you're the commissioner for Pioneer Sarah Creek, John also lives in that district as well. I know you've had some complications with um, different meetings being the same night, so my question is, yes. okay, <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, would you be interested in having John do the Pioneer Sarah Creek and you be the um, alternate, or sure. yes. would that work out? Yes. Okay, would you be interested in doing that? Um, it's once a month, but they do cancel one occasionally. Having said that, is that the third Thursday? It is. And that'd be this Thursday? And yes. I'm booked this Thursday, okay. but otherwise I'll well, maybe. This. But your alternate can go. Oh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so this Thursday, uh, Ms. Bruce can go, and then from then going forward, then you can go. Okay. And so what I do need tonight is I need a resolution appointing John Chumperlin as the Pioneer Sarah Creek Commissioner and representative from Minatrista. I do think I? you could probably do a motion, but if we can bring this back, put it on consent for the next time. Yes, we can because it won't be, it won't be so, effective yes. until the following month. So right. we yes. bring that because, back. Yeah, because we need to amend the um, appointments and designations right. again. So there's a couple okay. steps here. Thank you. So Ms. Bruce, you'll actually go as a commissioner. <laughs> and then next month we'll make that change. Thank you very much. So that's all I had. Oh, let's see. Uh, WCC meeting. We had a speaker from the Harrison Bay Senior Living that is going up in Mound, up a 110. Uh, it was very interesting. It is a 72 apartment uh, home building. 20 of them will be uh, for memory support. Um, the leasing office is now open. And the opening of the facility is going to be it's slated for October of this year. Oh, wow. Uh, it will have assisted living, enhanced care, and memory support. Um, what does enhanced care mean? Um, is that like nursing care? I think it's more like nursing care. It's okay. very uh, individual okay. apartments. And then, yes, more like um, shared responsibility, uh, oh, okay. bringing meals and that type of thing. Uh, the cost her apartment will range from $3,000 to $4,000 a month. Um, but they did say, I know that's a little sticker shock for a lot of people, um, but you have to keep in mind that this includes um, you know, all the things that you currently pay at your house now, your heating, your all those bills, mm -hmm. and a meal a day, which is prepared at the facility. Um, what else? I think that was about it. 
oh, I know. I asked them to do a booth at Trista Day so that they could talk to all the residents and see if there's anybody interested. Um, I went to the personnel meeting on the 4th as well. I went to State of the County oh, I did, on yeah, the I 10th. Did Thank you. Um, it was, ours was better, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Yes, uh, I was a little I did, disappointed. I, I, I heard that from a number of people that it was a lot of, I heard one comment, it was a lot of fluff. A lot of fluff and no right. answer or question in the answer yeah. period, which I was a little disappointed yeah. in as yeah. well. So. Um, and just a reminder that uh, if you see the checks run across for the pig races, um, that money has been saved for us for this year. So it's really not money coming out of the city. It has all been sponsored by our mm -hmm. great local vendors. Businesses. And businesses. Yeah. So. And Spirit of the Lake, Paul. The parade starts at 11 o'clock. They went back from 1, now they're back to 11. So if you guys are going to be doing that. It'll be easier to find, find volunteers for that. Yes. So, and if anybody wants to be involved in the parade. I can't this year. I, so. I've got other commitments here. And I, I'm on vacation yeah. that week. So if anybody else wants to be in the parade, let me know, and I will hook you up with a car. So you want to go? <laughs> <laughs> You're practicing your way. <laughs> okay. That's all. Um, LMCD, um, kind of piggybacking off of your comments on Hennepin County, um, we went through our grant process. Um, every year we have uh, the arm of LMCD, Save the Lake, that raises charitable contributions. Uh, we have in the past funded Hennepin County because uh, Hennepin County Water Patrol to have a dedicated officer on the lake, uh, Lake Minnetonka at all times uh, because Hennepin County um, and their infinite budget wisdom cannot seem to find enough money to actually fund this public safety uh, <coughs> and everything else, but they can't find that. So we, we uh, elected to once again uh, make that contribution to the Hennepin County Sheriff's Department to allow an officer to be on the water at all times. Um, we are also just starting the uh, budget process for uh, 19. Uh, 19. Mm -hmm. uh, the budget cycle runs July 1st, I believe. You have to, to certify it to the cities. Certify it to the yeah. cities by July 1st. By July 1st. I think 1st. The, yeah, I think the budget, so, uh, yeah, it, it, correct. Um, so it's actually looking a lot better than last year's budget process. Uh, so uh, it looks much more doable than in previous years. Um, not, there's still a lot of things that aren't funded at levels in the past, but at least it doesn't look like it's going to end up with a deficit. So. Okay, good. Thank you. And I just have the Pioneer Sarah Creek meeting coming up on yeah. Thursday that I'll be going to, and um, the Mound Fire Commission meeting on yep. the 25th. on the 25th, right. Yep. yep. It'll be an interesting one. <laughs> yeah. Didn't, I have a question about that, and just sure. real quick. We took land value out of the formula for... for that and yeah. that didn't seem to make a difference. Nope. Yeah. And interestingly enough, and that's kind of why I wanted to share some of these statistics, but um, Minnetonka Beach, their median home price is over a million dollars. Yeah, wow. a million one plus. So mm -hmm. that's, that's pretty significant. So that's, anyway, just, anyway. I think we figured out that homeowners might save about a dollar or something a week. Just like $50 a year something or something, yeah. For the residents, okay. so it's mm -hmm. not like they're thousands. I mean, total, it's a bunch of money, but for a parcel, yeah. well, we'll see what happens. Yeah. It's yep. not a done deal, as I've been told. I don't think it's the price, it's the response. If I've got a fire, yeah. I don't. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's actually true. what's the, the, the tough part for some of the council members that aren't in favor of bailing out. Mom's got an excellent fire. They do very good. Yeah, very down the road, yeah. Long lake, no, but it's nearby, but location too. Yeah, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. With that switch, does that not that I really care? But does that um, make a difference on their insurance? It, it might. It rates? might. It could. It could if Was depending on what the what the Long yeah, Lake, the, it could it depending yeah. what the Long Lake's uh, rating is. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing. Good question. Actually, yeah. mm -hmm. Something but, to consider. It's not just yeah. sticker. 
So, Mr. Chamberlain, we know you have a lot of meetings coming up. <laughs> so, good luck with that. <laughs> I do have a question. So, sure. on these other, like Pioneer Sear Creek and the other lakes on, so we're a voting member of these? Yes. yes. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, we're not just in a no. taking You're a commissioner. Notes. We're no. A commissioner. We okay. are a voting, yeah, Board voting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Right. All right. So then we are complete with all of our meeting agenda items. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, motion has been made by Ms. Mortensen and seconded by Ms. Bruce. All those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed, motion passes 5-0.